Hello and welcome to this video on transformations of graphs. Now let's just say we were to sketch y equals f of x where our function f of x is equal to x squared. So we're effectively we're sketching y equals x squared. We know it would look like this. So it is a kind of smiley face shape and it goes through the origin like that. So that's a sketch of y equals x squared. And if you haven't seen the video yet on sketching quadratic graphs, I advise you watch that first. Now, what would f of x plus 2 be? Now, we know that f of x is equal to x squared. So whatever the input is, x, then we do that input squared. So if we're now doing f of x plus 2. We replace the x with x plus 2. So it would be x plus 2 squared. So let's suppose we're now to sketch y equals f of x plus 2 instead. Well, again, remembering that video on sketching quadratic graphs, now if we write that out as the bracket repeated, we've got x plus 2, x plus 2. And remember, to find the x-intercept, we just make y 0. Now, we've got the product of two things is equal to 0. So if x plus 2 was 0, then x is minus 2. And if that was 0, x is also minus 2. So effectively, because it's a repeated solution, it touches at the minus 2. Because it's effectively kind of crossing minus 2, then crossing minus 2 immediately again, so it ends up touching it. Now let's compare this original graph where we sketched y equals f of x, and this modified graph where we sketch y equals f of x plus 2. Can you see that this graph has translated two units to the left. Now you might be wondering, do we have to sketch these graphs every time to see what's happened when we sketch this versus this? And the answer is no. I'm going to draw a summary table which summarizes everything you need to know about transforming graphs. So I'm going to have this column here for change, this column here for which axis it affects, and then this column here for what's the action. So if the change is inside the function, so can you see this example here, we modified the inside of the function, we replaced the inside, the input, x with x plus 2, so that was a change inside the function. If that happens, it affects the x-axis, and the action is to do the opposite of what you expect. Now with this particular example, so the change was inside, it affects the x-axis, and d, look from this graph to this graph, the translation was in the x direction, so it did affect the x values. And what does this opposite mean? Well, it basically means because we're adding 2 to the input, we've actually subtracted 2 from the x values. Look, that's an x value of 0, that minimum point there, but that minimum point has an x value of minus 2. We can see we've subtracted 2 from all the x values, so it was actually the opposite of adding 2. Now, if the change was outside the function, then it affects the y-axis, and it does what you expect. So let's go through a few examples. Let's go back to y equals f of x plus 2. We saw that was a translation. Now, we could say left two units, or we could even give it a vector. So a translation by minus 2, 0. And that's basically saying we have a movement where the x value is changed by minus 2, and the y value hasn't changed at all. What about this? y equals f of x minus 3. Well, the change is inside the function again, so it's going to affect the x-axis and will do the opposite of what we expect. So if we're subtracting 3 from the x-values, the opposite is adding 3 to the x-values. So we're going to be adding 3 to the x-values. If we add 3 to all the x-values, that's going to be a translation right by 3 units. So it's a translation by 3, 0. What about if we do y is equal to f of x plus 1? Now this time, this modification of the function is outside the function bracket, so that that plus 1 is outside, so it's going to affect the y values, and it's going to do what we expect. So this plus 1 here is going to affect the y values and do what we expect. We're adding 1 to the y values. So you think if you add 1 to the y values, that's effectively moving up 1. So it's a translation by the x value is not changing, so 0, and the y value, we're adding 1. Now this is actually we think being cut from the GCC syllabus. It definitely used to be in the old GCC syllabus, but where you can actually have scalings as well. But to be honest, we can just still use this table in exactly the same way. Can you see that this change is inside the function bracket? So what have we done to the x values? We've times them by 2. So that means we do the opposite. We divide the x values 2. So if the x values are divided by 2, 4, 0, for example, will become 2, 0, because we're halving the x values. So you can see it's like a, a kind of stretch. 
and it's going to be a stretch on the x-axis because it affects the x-values. And what's the scale factor? By scale factor half. Because you think if we divide the x-values by 2, that's the same as multiplying by half, isn't it? And the reason we call it a stretch rather than enlargement, by the way, is with an enlargement, you, um, you stretch both the x and the y-axis, whereas here, we're just stretching it x-wise. We're not stretching it y-wise, so it's not an enlargement. And lastly, this one, y is equal to 3f of x. Well, we're timesing f of x by 3, and the change is outside the function, so it's going to affect the y values and does what we expect, so we're timesing the y values by 3. So we times the y values by 3, we're effectively stretching on the y-axis by a scale factor of 3. So it's a stretch on the y-axis by a scale factor of 3. And sorry, I forgot a couple of examples here. Uh, we've also got y equals f of minus x. I do believe you need to know this one for the GCC syllabus. We can see we're negating the x values and the change is inside the function bracket, so it's going to affect the x values and do the opposite. Well, the opposite of negation is still just negation. So if you think, if you negate the x values, if I just draw something here, if I had, say, the point 3, 4, if I negate the x value, we're not affecting the y value. That becomes minus 3, 4. So that becomes minus 3, 4. And effectively, we've reflected in the y-axis. You can see it's a reflection in the y-axis. So this would be a reflection in the y-axis. Now, you could memorize this. Or, to be honest, if you just do what, exactly what I did, just sort of conjure up a point and then see what would happen using these rules here. And then finally, we've got y equals minus f of x. That minus is outside of the function bracket, so it affects the y values and does what you expect. So we're negating the y values. So that 3, 4 there would become 3 minus 4. You can see it's reflecting in the x-axis. So this is similarly a uh, reflection in the x-axis. Now let's do some examples. We've got a sketch here of y equals f of x, and we're already given the graph. And we've got just one feature here, which is the turning point, or the maximum point, which is 4, 8. We're given that coordinate. And we need to determine the coordinates of the turning points of these different modified functions, where the original function was y equals f of x. So let's do these. We've got 1, a. We've got y equals f of x plus 3. And we need to determine the turning point, i.e. what happens to this turning point here. Remember, the turning point is where the gradient is zero. Right, so we originally had the point 4, 8. So what happens to 4, 8? Well, this change here, plus 3, is inside the function bracket. So it affects the x values and does the opposite of what we expect. So we subtract 3 from the x value, and that then becomes 1, 8. The y value is unaffected. What about y is equal to f of x plus 3 with a plus 3 outside. Well, this plus 3 is outside the function bracket, so it affects the y values and does what we expect. So that means we're adding 3 to the y value, so we'll add 3 to that 8, so we get 4, 11. What about the third one? We've got y equals f of x minus 1. Well, the change is inside the function bracket, so it affects the x-axis and does the opposite of what we expect. So we're going to add 1 to the x value, so it's going to become 5, 8. What about d? We've got y equals f of 2x. And remember, this one probably won't appear in the GCC exam anymore because it's a stretch. So x be multiplied by 2, it's inside the function brackets. We do the opposite to the x values. We divide the x values by 2. So if we divide that x value by 2, it becomes 2, 8. What about e? We've got y equals 2 f of x. So the times by 2 is outside the function bracket, so it affects the y values and does what you expect. So we have times the y value by 2. So that y value of 8 gets multiplied by 2. It becomes 16. So it's 4, 16. Then we've got f. y is equal to minus f of x. Now it's a negation outside the function bracket, so it affects the y values, and we're going to negate the y value. So if it was 4, 8, that becomes 4 minus 8. And finally, g... We've got y equals f of minus x. So we're negating the x values this time because the change is inside the function. So we negate the x value and we get minus 4, 8. Right, question 2. Now you need to know how to uh, transform trigonometric graphs. So we want to sketch y equals 2 sine x plus 
90 degrees. Right, now let's first do a sketch of y equals sine of x. So from that video, we put increments of 90 on the x-axis, and we know that it goes between 1 and minus 1. So I just do it as a dotted line, sine of x, it starts at 0, 0, it goes up to 91, 180, 0, 270 minus 1, 360, 0 again. Now let's think what we're going to do here. We're adding 90 inside this sine function here, so we're going to do the opposite to the x values, so we're going to subtract x minus 90 from the x values. I translate left 90 degrees. And this here, this 2, is outside the sine function, so it means we're going to multiply the y values by 2. So times 2, the y values. Yep. So if we shift everything 90 left, that means our new graph is going to shift 90 left like that. Now I'm going to have to draw another graph because I haven't left enough space. But can you see the y values have multiplied by 2? So instead of between minus 1 and 1, I'm now going between minus 2 and 2. And we've subtracted 90 from the x values, so it's going to shift left uh, 90 degrees. So we're going to start at minus 90, and it's now going to go up to 2 like this. And let's put some other values here, 270, 360. And we're starting at minus 90, instead of starting at 0, it goes all the way up to 2 because we doubled the y values, down to minus 2, and then it's back where it started, but we could always do an extra bit of the graph here because the sine graph goes on forever. Now finally we've got this difficult question here. We've got this is a sketch of y equals a cos bx plus c. And here's a sketch here, and we don't know what a, b and c are, and we need to determine the values of a, b and c. Now, if you think about what a cos graph looks like, it goes between 1 and minus 1. We've got increments of 90 degrees again. And it starts at the 1 and comes down, doesn't it? Yeah, like this. Down to 180, up to 270, 0, 360, 1. Now let's work on the, what happens to the x value and the y value individually. Now can you see that between 0 and 360, this graph does one kind of oscillation. So it goes down and back up again. So that's one kind of cycle, and then it will repeat. But in this graph here, by the time we get to 360, how many sort of cycles have we done? We've done one, two, three. So can you see that we sort of squashed it by a scale factor of three? And that will occur because of that modification inside the cos function. So we know that b is going to be three because we had cos of 3x, x would be multiplied by three. So we do the opposite. It would divide the x values by three. And you can see we're going to get that kind of squash like that. Now let's work on the y values now. We know in the original graph that the y values go between 1 and minus 1. But we want to get to the y values being between 3 and minus 1. So we need to get to here, 3 and minus 1. Now firstly, notice what, how is this range here? You can see that distance there is 2, but that distance there is 4. Now because that's double, we must have had a stretch of scale factor 2. And that we can do by using that thing on front of the cost. Remember, if that function has been times by a, that's going to times the y values by a. So it must be that a is 2. And then if we multiply the y values by 2, instead of between 1 and minus 1, it's going to now go between minus 2 and 2. But we want to go between 3 and minus 1. Now what could we do to these values to get to these values? Well, we could plus 1, couldn't we? And that's what that plus c at the end does. That plus c is outside of the cos function, so we're gonna, it's going to affect the y values and add c to them. And we want to add 1, so therefore c is equal to 1. And we've got our answer. a was 2, c was equal to 1, and b was equal to 3. Now, something like that occurred at the end of a GCC paper once, and it was a particularly difficult GCC question. So well done if you understood that.